Hello everyone, you are watching Railways Explained. Today we'll talk about one very interesting concept that existed in Europe from 1957 to 1995. It was an international network of express trains, better known as Trans Europe Express, or just TEE. What is interesting and what motivated us to make this video is the fact that recently an initiative was launched to revive this concept in 2021, in the form of TEE 2.0. It's good to know that this initiative is only a part of the wider EU agenda to combat climate change and that the European Commission has recently marked the 2021 as the year of rail. This initiative will highlight the benefits of rail as a sustainable, smart and safe means of transport with a variety of activities that will put rail transport in the spotlight throughout 2021. The goal is to encourage the use of rail by both citizens and businesses and to contribute to the EU goal of becoming climate neutral by 2050. This story should represent our small contribution to achieving this goal. After the Second World War, Europe began recovering its international long-distance railway connections. Because of the damages caused by the war, railway infrastructure simply did not allow any significant speeds. In poor economic conditions, the process of reconstruction was very slow. Despite this, the first international long-distance rail connections were established already during 1945 and 1946. Among the first international railway services to be recovered is the one between Copenhagen and Paris, including a feeder train to Berlin. Then, in the 1950s, Europe began developing a new 200 km per hour rail network with the idea to compete with civil aviation. In parallel, more and more international long-distance passenger trains have been put in service, creating a network called Trans Express Trains. In 1957, this network was used as a basis to develop a concept of Trans Europe Express. The most important requirement for the development of TEE, which was supposed to guarantee its success, was the process of unification of rules, standards and procedures. For the existence of the concept, we should thank to Mr. Dan Hollander, then a director of Dutch National Railway Company. He was the first to propose and realize the idea of establishing the network of international first-class railway services, jointly operated by the railways of West Germany, France, Switzerland, Italy and the Netherlands. After some time, Belgium and Luxembourg also joined the game. With the concept, before mentioned railway companies tried to change the trend which was slowly but inevitably becoming threatening for railway transport. The shift of passengers to cars and airlines. The idea was to create a network of fast and comfortable international trains that would mostly attract business class but also regular passengers. All TE trains were first class only, similar to the luxury trains that were common before the Second World War except they were not luxurious to that extent and therefore much cheaper and able to serve much larger passenger flows. Passport controls were always done in trains and tickets were slightly more expensive compared to the standard first-class tickets because it was required to pay a special supplement in the amount that was in accordance with the distance. Where possible, TE train schedules were timed to allow a business traveler to make a round trip within a single day and to leave him enough time for business activities at the destination. Commercial speeds were above 100 km per hour with a maximum speed of 200 km per hour. Each train was specifically named and the stops were only placed in major cities. Some of TE trains already existed even before the creation of TE network but were simply modified and rebranded after 1957. One such train was Italian Sette Bello, introduced in 1953 and included as TE in 1947. The Sette Bello was the first high-speed train to run between Milan and Florence at a top speed of 160 km per hour.
due to different types of electric supply systems used in different countries and the fact that many sections weren't even electrified, TE initially included only diesel trains. In order to provide best possible service, special rolling stock was developed for the use on TE. The German Deutsche Bahn, for example, built the special first-class diesel multiple units, while the Swiss Federal Railways and the Dutch NS developed the diesel electric train sets. Besides that, the establishing of a TE network provided impetus for the development of special electric train sets and electric locomotives capable of operating at two or more different electrification systems. For example, Swiss SBB developed its own special electric train set, which was designed to operate at four different electrification systems. It was put into service in 1961, and it was capable of developing maximum speed of 160 km per hour. Belgian National Railways introduced Type 150 locomotives in 1962, capable of operating at three different voltages, followed by the four-voltage Type 160. Meanwhile, the France SNCF also developed something similar between 1964 and 1970 in the shape of class CC4100. In this way, already by 1975, all but two of the 43 TE trains were electrically powered, and most were locomotive hauled. But what happened to TE? At the peak of its operation in 1974, the TE network comprised 45 trains connecting 130 different cities, from Spain in the west to Austria in the east, and from Denmark in the north to the Italy in the south. By 1975, the TE was constantly improving, which was followed by permanent increase of supply. However, it was soon realized that the TE did not achieve desired success for European transport system. On one hand, the attractiveness of air traffic become high due to constant improvements of this mode of transport in terms of speed, frequencies, comfort and supply, and the road traffic was becoming faster and cheaper than rail, given the fact that cars became affordable and that highway network experienced a significant expansion. On the other hand, the issues with TE services such as significant delays, cancellations and absence of continuity combined with the technical stagnation and many problems of economic nature, caused the general failure of the railway passenger transport. This crisis of European railways and the subsequent reform are explained in more detail in one of our previous videos. In addition, in 1979, Deutsche Bahn completely restructured its network and introduced new national intercity services, which resulted in fewer TEE trains. The introduction of TGV service in France in 1981 and its subsequent expansion along with the expansion of other high-speed lines in Europe also contributed to even more TE trains being replaced by domestic high-speed services. After 1984, most of the services were abandoned except some national TE services, mostly in Italy and France. In that way, most TE trains disappeared and the new international intercity network began its momentum, known by the name Eurocity. Eurocity provided both the first and the second class service and became operational in May 1987. By this time, the last remaining TE trains were either rebranded or withdrawn, but the name TE actually continued to be used for a few domestic trains operating within France until June 1991. In September 1993, the former TE train, which ran non-stop between Brussels and Paris, as Eurocity train, was again renamed after TransEurope Express. This service was finally replaced by TGV on May 29, 1995, ending the formal use of the name TransEurope Express. But if you think Europe will never see TE trains again, you may be wrong. German Federal Minister of Transport Andreas Scheuer launched a proposal for TE 2.0 at a virtual conference of European transport ministers. It was basically a proposal to re-establish the network of international long-distance high-speed passenger trains. 
As with the initial TEE, the TEE 2.0 would operate during the day, but the proposed plan envisages that they should be followed by an expanded network of overnight trains. This initiative reflects the resurgence of interest in night trains as the result of a so-called flight shame movement, which arose recently in Scandinavia. However, each TE 2.0 service would link at least three countries, and proposal envisages that European blueprint needs to be developed. Services should be compatible with national high-speed lines in order to form such connections that stimulate demand, while using as few additional paths on domestic networks as possible. Also, as a precondition, it is necessary to significantly reduce travel times. Furthermore, a dedicated TE 2.0 company should be formed as an independent railway undertaking. For instance, this can be done by SNCF and DB jointly with other interested companies. Eight routes are proposed to be established in two phases. The first one immediately, while the second should wait completion of certain infrastructure projects, some of which you can see on the screen. Initial TE 2.0 services will include connections between Paris and Warsaw, Amsterdam and Rome, Berlin and Barcelona, and Amsterdam and Barcelona. Detailed routes are presented on the screen. Phase 2 of TE 2.0 services will include the trains running between Berlin and Rome, Paris and Budapest, Paris and Stockholm, as well as the Stockholm and Munich. Regarding the overnight TE and trains, the plan envisages the establishing of connections between Paris and Berlin, Brussels and Prague, Amsterdam and Venice, Frankfurt and Barcelona, Berlin and Rome, and Paris and Budapest. After the completion of before-mentioned German infrastructure projects, as part of the Phase 2, trains between Paris and Stockholm and Stockholm and Vienna should be established. The plan assumes that all these trains should eventually become able to operate at maximum speeds of 230 or 250 km per hour, and that these services should continue to evolve and expand over time. Railways Explain team thinks that TE 2.0 is an excellent proposal. Not only because Europe needs the more efficient network of International Express trains more than ever before, but also because it continues the tradition and uses the marketing power of the TEE concept. However, there are still a lot of problems that need to be solved. They are reflected in all European interoperability and economic issues, such as the existence of many different traction and train protection systems, national-level focus on railway administration, the issue of establishing uniform marketing and pricing rules, which is a consequence of different passenger rights rules. Also, we have the problems with different requirements for seat reservations, different rules for concessions, contracts and subsidies, different languages and operating rules, different technical requirements and quality levels. At the end, there are different expectations of stopping patterns, profit expectations and different forms of railway companies. Also, a much better coordination between different railway undertakings should be established in regards to the timetabling, certification procedures and fares. Some of these issues were already well addressed in recent EU legislation, but it only requires additional time to be implemented in practice. Some of them are currently being assessed, and some will remain as a problem. In any case, the TE 2.0 is planned to be established by 2025, and we hope it will represent a good move towards the recovery of European passenger railway transport. This was Railix Explained. Thank you for your attention, and stay tuned. Goodbye.